If it makes you feel ashamed and afraid of God, you've eaten from the wrong tree. It's Easter, which means that it is now time for legalists to inform us that because Easter has some sort of non-Jewish tradition in origin, that it is therefore something to be avoided. And so the story is basically rec recited that the origins of Easter as a celebration are from some other religions, um, primarily usually referencing Sumerian or Babylonian tradition, and that therefore this is something to be avoided. And I don't even particularly agree with the interpretation, um, but I'm going to proceed as if it's correct and just go from there and demonstrate how this is nothing but pure legalism and is solely intended to steal your peace and your joy and that there's no reason to care one way or another what the origin of a tradition is. Um, it's not important in any way, shape, or form. And so, first is to define what I mean by legalism, and that is that legalism is when what you do is the important thing. So it doesn't matter whether you like it, it doesn't matter whether you want to do it, what matters is, here's a rule, you follow it. Period. End of story. This is the rule, you follow it. And so this idea of not celebrating Easter, and I want to clarify that I'm, I'm talking about not celebrating Easter, where you've got some kind of superstition against the word Easter and particular activities such as egg painting and, uh, you know, whatever, Easter bunnies, that you've got some superstition against these things, because legalism is also superstition. They're, the, they're both the same thing, um, because what it is 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 that you think that there's something wrong with something on a basis that has no foundation in reality. So legalism and superstition generally tend to be the same thing. So if you've got a superstition that you can't use the word Easter and call it Easter because you think that the word Easter has an incorrect kind of origin, rather that it's a non-Jewish origin for the word, and that you therefore refuse to celebrate, quote, Easter, end quote, you're a legalist, which is also a form of superstition. Um, and so I don't agree with this concept. And legalism is where it's the rule that matters. And if you can imagine being married to a legalist, the, the arrangement would say something along the lines of, the act is to be performed so many times per week for this such and such duration. I don't care if you like it. I don't care if you enjoy it. I don't care for it to be in any way, shape, or form an expression of love or intimacy. I only care that it happens for this number of times and for this duration. That's legalism. There's nothing loving about it. There's... And if you can imagine being married to such a person, I would think that, that you'd feel like a harlot or like property or a servant or a slave. You would not feel like an intimate partner. You would not feel like an important, an important part of the relationship. You would feel like you have a duty to perform that is required of you, and all that matters is that you perform it. That's what legalism is. It's completely stripped of emotion in any way, shape, or form. There's no heart to it. There's, this is the rule, you shut up and you do it. And God is not a legalist. And if that's news to you, God is not a legalist. Let me repeat it again. God is not a legalist. Okay? He doesn't have a bunch of rules that he says, you shut up and you do these things and I'm happy. 
And if you, sh if you don't do these things, then I'm unhappy. God is not a legalist, but if you refuse to celebrate Easter and call it Easter, you know, I, I, I'm not talking about like, if you don't celebrate Easter because like, so what? I don't care. You know, like, it's just another day. That's fine. That's not legalism. That's, that's apathy. Um, but I'm talking about the, the actual superstitious apprehension that Easter is some sort of heathen, pagan, you know, celebration that worships some other deity that, you know, didn't create the universe, which there aren't any. There's only just the one. Um, and so, you know, that's just a form of legalism to say that because it doesn't have this correct origin, then therefore it's wrong. And so if we switch over and start looking at some things here, one of the things that's said to be associated with is the Queen of Heaven. Now, the Queen of Heaven is actually only mentioned five times, all of them by Jeremiah, four of them in one short segment in chapter 44. And what we can see, I'm not going to go through it in much detail, but it says that the women need their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings. And then in 44.17, it says pour out drink offerings and burn incense. Um, 44.18, we've got burning incense again and more drink offerings. 44.19, drink offerings and making cakes and burning incense. And 44.25, it says again to burn incense and pour out drink offerings. So we've got burning incense, pouring out drinking off drink offerings, and baking cakes. These are the things that, according to the Bible in Jeremiah, are associated with the Queen of Heaven. There's no mention of Easter bunnies, and there's no mention of painting eggs. I'm sorry, they aren't there. So if you want to if you you know if you want to try and say that this association with the queen of heaven is in involved in easter i don't see it not from this source at any rate um but even never minding that is the fact that it just doesn't matter what the source of it is the idea that be, is being promoted is that if it is not of Jewish origin, if it's not a Jewish tradition, if it is not from Jewish literature, it is somehow, therefore, of the devil. That, you know, Jewish equals God, not Jewish equals not God. And that's completely and utterly faulty interpretation to begin with. And so, one thing to look at here, Isaiah chapter 1, is uh, a, a passage talking about God not actually being very uh, fond of the Jewish celebration. It says uh, in verse 14 of chapter 1, Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. So apparently either God hates holidays altogether or maybe the Jewish holidays aren't so so brilliantly wonderful. Now, we're going to go to Acts chapter 17, where Paul is going to be in Athens, and he's going to tell them about how they worship the wrong gods, and they need to turn and worship, worship the Jewish God and observe the Jewish traditions. So in Acts chapter 17, starting at ver Ooh. Ooh. Uh, boy, is my face red. It seems that Paul doesn't tell them that they're worshiping the wrong gods and that they need to worship Jewish gods and observe Jewish traditions. <sighs> Man, I, I feel really embarrassed that I introduced it that way. It, it, it actually looks like something entirely opposite happens here. Um, so, whew, man, I was just... I, I, I wish I had prepared properly and, and realized that Paul didn't tell them that they needed to become Jews. Uh, well, let's let's go through it and see what we see. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, in verse 16, Paul's in Athens, and it says, Now while Paul waited for them at, at Athens, 
His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market day, in the market daily with them that met with him. Now, wait a second. First of all, I'm, I'm a little confused. He's in Athens and he sees the city wholly given to idolatry. So he disputes in the synagogue with Jews it would seem like he should be going somewhere else other than the synagogue to the Jews if the issue is idolatry, unless the Jews were guilty of idolatry in the synagogue. Which means that maybe the God that they were worshiping in the synagogue wasn't actually the real creator. Just something to think about and consider. Verse 18, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So now he's got Greek philosophers, Epicureans and Stoics, confronting him, telling them, telling Paul that he's got a, he is a setter of strange gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, I don't know, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. They thought this to be a new doctrine, preaching of Jesus and the resurrection. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know, therefore, what these strange things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there sp spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So we, hear, we see here in verse 21 that there are Athenians and strangers. We see in verse 18 there are philosophers of the Epicureans and Stoics. This makes it clear that this is not a Jewish audience. This is a Greek audience that he's speaking to, and he's in Athens. So, first he had an argument with the Jews in the synagogue. Now he's being confronted by Stoics and Greek philosophers. So, obviously what Paul's going to do is he's going to point them to the Jewish traditions and Jewish literature and tell them about how their gods are not the correct gods. But that's not at all what he does. Instead, what he does is he quotes Greek philosophers and a Stoic philosopher in order to show them that what they believed pointed toward the true creator. So he took what they already believed and showed how Greek philosophy points to the true creator. So we get to verse 20 and it says, For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. Oh, we already read that. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So now we're at verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and held to your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom, ye, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. So he says, I'm going to tell you about this unknown God that you ignorantly worship. And so he continues, God that made the world and all things therein. He's making it clear. He's talking about the one who created everything, not about some local patriarchal deity out of, out of a multitude of, of many. He's talking about the creator, the singular creator. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So here's the creator of everything, and he gives to all life and breath and all things, and has made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell upon the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. 
verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, because he is Emmanuel, God within us and with us. For in him we live and move and have our being. That is a quote from Epimenides. As certain of your own poets have said, and he's now referring to Aratus, and he's going to quote Aratus, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven, like perhaps Ten Commandments, by art and man's device. So what I want to look at is in verse 28, it says, He's got two quotations from Greek philosophers. One, one of Aratus is a Stoic philosopher, and Epimenides is a Cretan philosopher. And Epimenides says, For in him we live and move and have our being. And Aratus says, For we are also his offspring. And here's the thing. I want to show what Paul is actually quoting, because it might be shocking if you don't know this. And I took, I have as my source here a screenshot that I took from Wikipedia. And so Epimenides being quoted here, he, he was also quoted in um, Titus chapter 1 verse 12 where uh, Paul said, Cretans are always liars, evil, evil beasts, idle bellies. Um, but here's here's where this for in him we live and move and have our being comes from this and it says they fashioned a tomb for you holy and high one okay now I just want to pause and note that here holy and high one is referencing Zeus so Paul is quoting a poem about Zeus and it says they fashion a tomb for you, holy and high one. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies, but you are not dead. You live and abide forever, for in you we live and move and have our being. And the commentary from Wikipedia says, The lie of the Cretans was that Zeus was mortal. Epimenides considered Zeus immortal. So here Paul is taking a poem about Zeus and applying it to Jesus. I want you know let that sink in for a second that Paul was able to take something about Zeus and say look how this tells you about Jesus. So then we get this the same kind of analysis that we see here. And then this is this is Aratus where he quoted, for indeed we are his offspring. Again, let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of Zeus. Even the sea and the harbor are full of his deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are indeed his offspring. Paul quoted writings about Zeus and made them apply to Jesus. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Paul did not correct them and say, Zeus is a false... Not only that, but let's go back. He said that it was the unknown God that made everything. Zeus is not an unknown God. Zeus was the one they considered their most high God. So he's really either confused about what he's saying or he's trying to point out that there's only one God. There is only one God. All the rest are just shadows of God. And I find it disturbing that we can look at the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis and see a shadow of Christ, but we look at the story of, of Horus or Krishna, or any of these other things that are claimed to be things that this, the Christ story is, uh, you know, a ripoff of, or, or parallels, or, or whatever, and we don't see a shadow of Christ, we see a deception. 
well, why is why is Joseph then not a deception? Why is Joseph a shadow of Christ, and these other figures are a deception? That makes no sense, except for that is a superstitious legalism that says that Jewish tradition is correct and non-Jewish tradition is incorrect. But Paul clearly begs to differ because he took what was written about Zeus and applied it to Jesus. So I, I hope that somebody's religion has died today so that what can be resurrected is the true son. And so... One, when, when I started and I said that I don't even really buy into the idea that the story of Easter has as its roots this origin with the Queen, Queen of Heaven, when I first came across these kinds of stories, and, and it applies to Christmas as well, was as an atheist, from atheist sources, using these things in order to discredit the Jesus story and saying that Jesus is just this amalgamation of all these other other tales, Middle Eastern tales, consolidated together, cherry picked this portion and that portion and everything. And so the whole first encounter that I had to these kinds of these kinds of interpretations was from the atheists in order to say Jesus is just, you know, the newest incarnation of the sun god. And so I find it interesting that the very same thing is being turned around by people who call themselves Christian and taking the same exact narrative and not using it to discredit Christianity, but using it to tell you don't celebrate a holiday. So, you know, the the one group at least is trying to tell you don't don't you know get locked into a religion. The other group is trying to say don't have any fun. And and I even saw a comment somewhere on one of these these you know Easter is Ishtar things, uh, and it actually was a comment from somebody saying saying that. You shouldn't be having fun on this somber occasion. Like, God is anti-fun. And that we, what he really wants you to do is be in sackcloth and ashes and, and wailing and whining and crying and, and feeling awful. Like, that's what make God, makes God happy is not celebration, but mourning and grieving. And that's just completely and utterly wrong. I, I couldn't believe that I actually came across a comment that almost almost to a point said, don't have fun. <laughs> I mean, personally, I think that's ungodly to tell people don't have fun. Um, especially if it's purely, I mean, especially when the fun we're talking about is painting Easter eggs. And... <laughs> I mean, if you can if you can spend time with your children having fun painting Easter eggs, go for it. Because for a lot of people, that's time spent with their children that they wouldn't be spending otherwise. Yeah, you know, to to object to the whole thing is just sickening. Um but this this whole thing it's interesting to me how many parallels there are between atheists taking a, an interpretation of things and it's exactly the interpretation that Christians have. And all they do is draw, draw a different conclusion. So the atheists take exactly the same information, exactly the same interpretation, and then say, well, if that's the case, then, you know, here's my conclusion. Whereas Christians take the same information and draw a different conclusion. And one of the most, you know, disturbing ones for me is, is with Calvinism's obsession with taking exactly the same. You can, you can, I actually had an argument with a, with a Calvinist 
And here's some verses he threw at me, and this could have just as easily been an atheist, because these are exactly the verses that atheists will throw at you. 1 Samuel 2.6, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down the shield and raises up. Job 5.18, for he inflicts pain and gives relief. He wounds, and his hands also heal. So, I mean, and this is a Calvinist making sure that I have an understanding that I've overestimated the love of God. He was disturbed that I've overestimated the love of God and overestimated the mercy of God, and he wanted to make sure that I understood the, the, the cruelty of God. And so he takes these verses and throws them at me and says, you know, here, let me, let me prove to you how cruel and, and wicked God is. And then when I said, well, that's wicked, he had issue with that. You know, so here a Calvinist takes this verse and says, this is who God is, worship him. And an atheist at least has the sanity to look at these verses and go, well, if that's who God is, count me out. Um, so, you know, this narrative that all our holidays are are just, you know, some kind of uh, Sumerian tradition as if Sumerian means evil. Um, and that as a result, therefore, these holidays should not be observed is just something I never accepted in in the first place, even as an atheist, when the information was intended to discredit Christianity, I kind of looked at it and said, I really don't see it. I don't see the parallel. I don't see, I don't see the connection. And I'm a kind of person that uh, I like to say that I see patterns where people don't even know there's anything to see. So if I thought the con the connections were a stretch, as an atheist, in terms of attempting to discredit Christianity, I can't imagine how how much more do I not believe when the attempt is to tell me don't observe a holiday. So, my recommendation is that the dawn services, if there ever were any, if the if the narrative of the pagan origins is accurate. That the observance of a of a morning service at dawn to observe the sunrise in the east is really the origin that what you're doing what it was was it was rather a shadow of a morning service at dawn to observe the rising of the Son of God on Easter. Happy Easter. Don't be a legalist.